invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to 1 John, chapter number 5. 1 John, chapter number 5. We'll continue preaching through this letter called 1 John. God willing, this morning we'll be looking at verses 9 through 12 together. I'd like to read those verses and then have a word of prayer and then preach to you for just a little while from the Word of God. Chapter 5, beginning in verse number 9. It says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I'd like for us to join together in prayer, and I want to ask you to ask the Lord to speak to your heart this morning from these verses, and that you will yield yourself, your mind, your spirit to the Lord as his word is preached. Shall we pray together? Father in heaven, I desire to preach your word in the power of your spirit and not in the strength of my flesh. And Lord, I pray this morning that your people that know you would hear your word and be edified and built up. I pray for those who do not know you, Lord, that you would clearly speak to their heart today. I pray, dear Lord, that if there's anyone here that may not be a believer, that you would show that to them, and this would be the moment, this would be the hour of salvation for them. God, we know that that would be a work of you. And Lord, we trust you to do that. And Lord, I pray now as I yield myself to you for your help. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You'll notice the title, Testimony Time. So I want to ask you, what comes to your mind personally when you hear the words testimony or testify? My mind usually goes to church services that I've been in since I was a child where I've heard the people of God testify about the goodness of the Lord and the salvation of the Lord. Other times, my mind goes back to campfire services at, at church camp on summer nights, usually a Thursday night or a Friday night where I listened to hundreds of campers testify about the work that God had done in their heart during that week at camp and the decisions that they had made as a result of His divine work. Perhaps when you hear the word testify or testimony, your mind doesn't go to the church house or the campground, but rather it goes to the courtroom or the courthouse where perhaps you have been called to literally testify on a witness stand or you have listened to the testimonies of others. Regardless of what we think about individually, it is a word that most of us can identify with and is clearly the key word of our text this morning here in verses 9 through 12. It comes from that root word, martus, and it, it simply means someone who has personal knowledge of something. Seven times in these four verses, we're going to look at this morning a word uh, which is translated as testimony, testify, witness, or record is used to emphasize the reliability of the evidence that is presented by the Apostle John in this text regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to keep in mind, in large part, John was writing to a Jewish audience. 
They were trained to evaluate someone's testimony. For example, in a trial, Jewish law required the presence of at least two or three witnesses. And they did not allow just anyone to serve as a witness. They had to be considered as a reliable witness. The repeated use of this word, uh, one word that we see here in various forms, speaks of the considerable and substantial and clear evidence that has been given to prove the truthfulness of what we find and read in the Bible about the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the overall uh, focus of John's writing this was to assure believers of their faith in Christ and then also to battle and speak against the false teachers who had taught a different Christ than the one John had walked with and talked with and served with for three years, who was 100% God and 100% man. For you see, when it's all said and done in the final analysis, it is impossible to remain neutral about Jesus Christ and the testimony that he has been given. Every reader, every listener must make a decision based on the evidence that we have in the Word of God. This is substantial evidence of both human and divine origin. And in the words of one author named Josh McDowell, it is evidence that demands a verdict. So let's look together now at the types of testimonies that are presented here in our text this morning. We see, first of all, the immortal testimony. Notice with me verse 9. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Now we see two types of testimony mentioned in this verse, human and divine, that of man and that of God. Now as humans, we generally make decisions based upon trusted evidence. We regularly receive the testimony of other men or women if we believe that it is reliable. This is true in the normal flow of life as well as in the legal law of courts. For example, if my family members or my friends say to me, boy, I ate at that restaurant and that is a good place to eat because I know that they have the same food taste as I do and grew up eating the same kind of foods, then, then usually I will give it a try based on their testimony. If John Myers, who has worked at uh, Duncan Ford for uh, over 30 years, if he says to me, Kevin, uh, I, I don't know about buying that car, but this car has a reliable track record, then I will listen to that because of his experience and because of his personal testimony from what he has witnessed. Now, this matter that's mentioned here, if we receive the witness of men, it can mean what I just mentioned, that the way we do that regularly. It can also be talking about the witness we hear of men as the word is preached and as we hear it taught and so forth. But the fact is plain. We listen to and receive the witness of men. The same is true with juries and judges in the legal system in regard to the testimony of witnesses. They will listen to and believe reliable testimonies. Now notice how the Apostle John's argument takes us from the lesser to the greater here. Where he is saying there, if we believe the testimony of reputable human witnesses, and we do, how much more should we believe the greater testimony of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ? Surely the witness of God is a superior witness. Surely the subject of Jesus Christ is a superior subject than many of the things that we hear testimony 
about. You'll notice the latter part of verse 9 states he has testified. And when I say he, I'm talking about the Lord, God Almighty. He has testified and is on the record as a witness to his son, Jesus Christ. In our study on Wednesday evening, we looked at the threefold witness to the validity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And we noticed those verses, verses 6 to 8, and, and in those verses, three witnesses uh, were found there that we studied about, the water, the blood, and the Spirit. And all of them are part of the uh, immortal testimony that God has given and the external testimony that has been given concerning Jesus Christ. We find that God brought forth these three witnesses as well as many others in order to substantiate his own declaration that Jesus is the Christ. And remember, when we, we hear that title, Jesus, his humanity, is the Christ, that is talking about the fact that he is the Messiah. And when we see him referred to as the Son of God, it's referring to his deity. What do these three witnesses mean? Very quickly, let me review for those that were here on Wednesday and then uh, teach what we find here for those who may not have been here. The term water refers back to his baptism, which initiated his earthly ministry. We read about that in Matthew 3 and in Mark 1. And you recall that when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in Jordan, those that were there heard the audible voice of God the Father who said loudly, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He made it clear right away by that audible testimony about his Son. Peter, James, and John, who wrote the letter we're in, in Matthew 17, we're on the Mount of Transfiguration where they received a glimpse of, of Christ being transfigured and they got a glimpse of His heavenly glory for just a, a bit. And when they did, they once again heard God the Father say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter wrote about that in the second letter uh, that bears his name, Turn a couple pages over there to 2 Peter chapter number 1. And I want you to look with me at verse, verse 16 to 18 because you're talking about a reliable testimony. This is one. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Notice with me in verse number uh, 16 down through verse number 18. Peter wrote this. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Peter's saying here, we're not making up a bunch of stories. We're not making up a bunch of Walt Disney tales or Aesop's fables. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. We were eyewitnesses to his majesty. You'll notice the second witness is the blood. The blood, this of course goes straight to the cross, the crucifixion, where the sinless lamb shed his blood in atonement for our sin. He became the sacrifice for my sin and for your sin. You'll recall while on the cross, God manifested his presence and power convincingly and substantially by several uh, what we would call miracles or physical phenomenons which occurred. The darkness that fell on the earth for three hours from noon to 3 p.m. as God the Son hung on that cross. The tearing of the temple veil in two. 
when Jesus said, it is finished. And as I mentioned Wednesday night, it was no little curtain uh, like that over there or something that may go in front of a baptistry. This veil was 60 feet high. It was six inches thick. And it was torn in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the price had been paid the blood had been offered so that man could now enter in to the Holy of Holies without a high priest, without bringing his own personal sacrifice because the sacrifice had been made once and for all when that blood was shed. The earth quaked. Graves were opened. Dead were raised back to life. And as that Roman soldier who perhaps helped put him on the cross, as he beheld all of this, the darkness, the quaking of the earth, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. Of course, three days later, his deity was proven further and gloriously when he arose from the grave. And then 40 days later, he ascended up to heaven. Jesus Christ gave witness through the blood. And then you'll notice the third witness there in verses 6 and 8 is the Spirit. The Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. Visually, we see him coming in the form of a dove at the baptism. When he descended upon Christ upon his baptism in Jordan. Then following his resurrection, the Spirit fell upon his disciples on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after, after the resurrection, empowering them to witness. And Acts 2 tells us when the Spirit came, it came as a, he came as a sound of a mighty rushing wind and like fire. They received the miraculous gift of tongues in order to proclaim the gospel in 13 different dialects that are listed there in Acts 2 that were present at Jerusalem during that time. The result of the, the great power of the Spirit coming was 3,000 people repenting and being saved, believing and baptized on that one day. Yes, His Spirit is a witness to who He is. God's witnesses of the water, the blood and the Spirit were external, immortal testimonies of an immortal son. That brings us to the second testimony that we see here in verse 10. And that's an internal testimony. Notice verse 10, the first part says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness or testimony, now notice this word, in himself. In himself. That's talking about the believer. This is the eternal record, internal record of God's testimony through the person of the Holy Spirit of God who indwells believers who have believed in the Christ of the Bible. Now this isn't the first time this has been mentioned in our study of 1 John as we've gone all the way from the first verse all the way to these verses together. We saw it in chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, chapter 3, verse 24, chapter 2, verse 27. It talks time and time again about the indwelling of God's Spirit within believers. This, once again, is speaking of the inward confirmation of the external evidence within the child of God. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just external truth, but it is also experiential truth. Truth that comes to those who believe in, who trust in Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel. It's not just external or intellectual knowledge, but it is an internal matter in our spirit. And in our heart, the innermost part of man, which is affirmed by the illumination of the indwelling Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Is it talking about a feeling? Does this mean you will never doubt? 
What if you feel weak in your faith at times and then strong at other times? Well, this isn't talking about a feeling. Rather, it's talking about assurance. Assurance that the indwelling Spirit gives when we believe and trust in Christ, who died for our sins and rose again according to the Scriptures. And we put our faith, our genuine faith, in Him and what He did for us. In believing and trusting in Him, we can become confident and assured that we are children of God, not based on a feeling, but based on the Word of God and the Spirit of God about who Christ is and how He saves us. We need to thank God this morning for the internal witness of His indwelling Spirit that is given to those who believe in the Christ of the Bible. There are a couple different testimonies that I looked at this week about this. One of them was Paul in, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 2 when he was talking about salvation. He said, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Notice the word believe. Paul said, I know whom I believed in. That is Jesus Christ, God the Son. I have believed in him. I've committed my, my soul salvation, my eternity to him. Hence, he had the assurance of that. I ask you today, have you put your faith in this one that the Apostle Paul believed in. If you have, Paul was no more saved than you are. If you have trusted the Christ who died on the cross and rose again, that is the same Christ that Paul trusted in. And you can say, I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. This matter of putting our faith in and believing in and trusting in God's eternal Son is so important to having eternal life. For you notice here in our verse, verse number 10, not believing God's testimony regarding His Son, Jesus, is a serious matter with eternal consequences. And we'll look at this in the last uh, testimony. We'll see here the eternal testimony. The latter part of verse 10 and then all the way through verse 12, we see this expressed. Don't miss this. The latter part of verse 10 says, He that believeth not. He's talking about another, another group of people here. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. I want you to, to get something here. If you're, if you're here today and you have not believed, or maybe you have been trusting partly Christ and partly yourself, perhaps you've thought, well, I, yes, I believe in Jesus, but yeah, and I, got, I got baptized when I, was, when I was a kid, and I joined the church, and, and I got that going for me too. Folks, salvation is 100% Jesus Christ. Faith in what he did for us. It's not in what we do for him. It's in what he did for us. He paid the price. All right, so you'll notice here that refusing to believe in Christ is equal to calling God a liar. That's what it says here. Now, you may, when you refuse Christ, you may say, well, I'm not going to believe what that preacher says. I don't believe that preacher. Uh, he, he's, just, he's just up there blowing hot air. No, I'm just reading to you what, what the divine inspired word of God says. I am telling you that if you reject Jesus Christ and you say, I do not believe he is the eternal son of God, then you are calling God the Father a liar. That's what this verse says here. And such rejection is the ultimate form of blasphemy because it is an attack at the very character of a holy God. If 
by rejecting his testimony. A non-believer is considering God to be an untrustworthy witness and is rejecting the testimony of God himself. When people reject Jesus Christ, they are doing that at their own peril and are actually rejecting eternal life because belief in Jesus as God's son and eternal life, you'll see here, are inseparable. <clears throat> you'll notice that's clearly conveyed in verse 11 and 12. Notice what it says there. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. So we see here very clearly that to know Jesus Christ as our Savior is to know eternal life life. To reject Christ and say no to Christ is to not have eternal life. So as I stand here and tell you this this morning, I'm doing this out of love and concern for your soul. And I want you to see here that there is, there is a, a relation to what Jesus said in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John heard him say that. John was there when he said that. And these are the words of Christ. We receive eternal life through Christ. Not through the Baptist church or the Methodist church or any church. We receive eternal life through the person of Jesus Christ. It's through him and what he did for us. Now what I want you to see here, please don't miss this. There is not three possibilities here, such as believers and unbelievers and then neutral people. We don't see that here. There's two groups, believers and non-believers. There's not a place there that, that says, well, I just believe that anybody in any religion that's sincere is okay. Well, that may, that may work out good in your mind. But that's not what Jesus said, and that's not what the Word of God says. There's not a neutral position here. Now, what I want to say to believers is, as believers, we are not waiting for eternal life. We receive it when we believe God's testimony about Jesus Christ. So if there's some here today that you've grown up in a background where you think you're going to have to wait until you, you die and stand before God, and then he's, he's going to uh, judge you on your good deeds and your bad deeds, and you won't know then whether you're going to heaven or hell, we receive eternal life when we believe. Because eternal life is not just a length of time. Eternal life is also a quality of life with God. It is a life that we enjoy here and now with the Lord. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so we receive eternal life now. We will experience the length of it in eternity. But we do not have to wait until eternity to enjoy the eternal life that we have with Christ. This promise from God that we have eternal life through his son, what does it give to us? I'll tell you what it gives. It provides incredible assurance and peace. And the longer you are saved, the more you will enjoy that and appreciate that. As you watch the world around you crumbling at times, as you watch people that when they have problems, and we have problems too as believers, sometimes more. My preacher used to say, I've got more problems than a fifth grade math book. But then he would always say, but I know the problem song. 
Amen. And that's the Lord. And as Crystal testified, His grace is sufficient. That's part of having eternal life. Not later, but now. And so it gives assurance and it gives peace. And I want to encourage you today as believers, if you have put your faith in the Christ of the Bible and what he's done for you, you can have that assurance. You can have that peace. But the evidence is considerable. It's substantial. It's clear. It comes from human and divine testimonies. And yes, it is evidence that demands a verdict. We cannot remain neutral about Jesus Christ and the testimonies that have been given. We must decide to believe God's testimony about His Son or to reject His testimony about Him. If you'll hold your place, you don't have to hold your place here because I'm about done. If you'll turn over to chapter 1, in verse 1, I just want to remind you the first words that John wrote in this letter, if you'll notice with me, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, talking about the apostles, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled or touched of the word of life. That's talking about Jesus Christ. For the life was manifested or revealed or made known, and we have seen it, and bear witness or testimony, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. My friend, if you are a believer in Christ, you can have that assurance. You can have the joy that comes from knowing him now. And knowing that the moment that your heart stops beating and you breathe that last breath, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My friend, that's a hope. That's an assurance that money cannot buy. Money cannot buy that because it's something that's given from God, but it's something that we must receive as a man or a woman. And so this morning, I want to invite you to believe God's testimony and to put your faith in Him. Perhaps you're here and you've been considering this, You've been thinking about it, but you keep putting it off. You keep waiting. You keep thinking, I'll do it next time. Perhaps you're here and you're, you're dependent on something else. You may be a good person. You, you may love hearing the Bible preached, and you might believe in your head in Jesus. But the time has never come when with your heart, you believed, you committed, you trusted in Him as your Savior. And I want to give you an opportunity right now, if the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and knocking on your heart, if He is, I don't have to tell you what that's like. Because anybody who's ever come to Christ has been drawn by the Spirit of God. So don't let Satan distract you. Don't start fiddling with your, with your stuff or looking at your phone. This is serious business. And you may be saved, but there may be somebody behind you that's not. We're talking about eternity. Eternity. That's a long time. Will you believe or will you reject Christ today? That choice is yours to make. And we're going to bow our heads together at this time. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If God is dealing.